Welcome to the podcast. And Thank you for having I'm me. Very glad to be joined by Tom Professor Tom Williamson, who is a professor of history or landscape history. Landscape at, history. Landscape history at the University of East Anglia. Yep. And can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do in your research here and the kind of things and areas that you've been working on? Right. Um, I I started as a, an archaeologist and as a historian, and I drifted into landscape history just before I came here. Uh, the great thing I like about landscape history is we are, we're the last, seems to me, of the generalists in history. The more and more history gets concentrated down to what I always refer to as the two wet weekends in 1642 kind of history. And we have much broader chronological span. And uh, all I work on stuff from prehistory right up to the 19th century. And that would be things that are partly in the realm of historical geography and agricultural history. Uh, do a lot of work on, on field systems and uh, enclosure and that kind of thing. I do a lot of work about designed landscapes, parks and gardens. And increasingly I'm involved in, in, in historical ecology kind of stuff, although I'm not an ecologist, but I... Um, I, I, in an amateurish way, I do the kind of stuff that Oliver Rackham did, I suppose, and I think about that. So particularly on trees, on, on woodland, uh, and at the moment, in particular, taking up most of my time on, on orchards. So it landscape history, uh, for those who aren't, uh, the listeners who don't know, is a sort of mishmash or a mashup, as they say now, of um, historical geography, historical ecology, social history, and archaeology, really, that's what it is. And mm. it's a good excuse to study anything that you're interested in. Yeah, I think a lot of people have this idea of the landscape, especially the British landscape, as somehow natural or sort of part of this wilderness, especially the more wild areas, that it somehow has an, a natural state in some way and that humans have interfered with it. But that's really not the case, is it? No, there's, there's almost nothing about the English landscape which hasn't been heavily modified. I mean, heavily modified. So heathland, downland, moorland, um, the, the Northumbrian fells, almost everything has been modified by. So, so it's not just the kind of fields uh, and, and settlements which are humanly created, but just about everything is. And in the process of doing that, that shaped our concept of what is natural too, interestingly. So wilderness, no. It, 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 it's wilderness effectively disappeared from England probably in late prehistory. I mean, it was... Is that early? I would say so. I would say so. There are big areas of land which weren't being used for, for arable agriculture, but they're being intensively grazed. Mm. So if you look at Anglo-Saxon documents, one of the uh, uh, charters, one of the things you often uh, often get donated are, are swine pastures. And they're obviously great big areas, because they are big areas, where you graze pigs. But if you graze semi-domesticated pigs over a very large area, that's not a natural landscape. Yeah. I mean, people sort of, I think, think that even only two or three hundred years ago, there was some kind of sort of natural state that farming and agriculture was somehow didn't have the impact that it has now. But it really did, didn't it? It really yeah. had sort of a really extensive impact just in a different way to current farming and current sort of landscape interventions. Yes, and, that, and, and that's gone back centuries. So uh, even to the point, I mean, a good example would be uh, the kind of trees we're familiar with. And that's quite a hot topic now because of uh, the accelerating rate of tree diseases coming into this country. So we, we lost elm as a tree, although obviously not as a shrub, uh, in the 60s and 70s, and then we got um, Calara uh, coming now on, on the ash, and the uh, uh, processionary moths, uh, moth, sorry, and the disease in horse chestnut. A whole series of diseases have, have come in and, and picking off the trees. And that, so we're aware of the trees, aware of their position as kind of natural objects in the natural world and how they are under threat from, from whether it's climate change or globalization or whatever. But the kind of trees we got in the landscape, there's nothing very natural about those. And that's, that realisation has only come really quite recently. So the classic would be, if we go into an area of ancient semi-natural woodland, the dominant timber tree is oak. And so people always assume that oak, or for a long time assumed, that oak was the natural climax vegetation of the country. But when pollen analysis came along, it rapidly became apparent, okay, no, nothing of the kind. The, the dominant vegetation over most of lowland England 
was uh, the dominant tree uh, was small leaf lime, Tilia cordata. Now, mm. Tilia cordata, I could go for a walk. I could walk for weeks in Norfolk and not see Tilia cordata, or indeed anywhere in England or most places in England. It's now very, very restricted. You hard. I can think of six hedges around here with it in and a handful of woods. So oak is dominant because we decided it would be dominant and we have encouraged it and planted it. Mm. Also, there's a cultural side, isn't it? I think there's sort of a sense of attachment of English identity to the oak tree. Yep. And you see there's lots of organisations sort of attach themselves to the oak tree and this yes. idea that it's sort of symbolic of old England in a way yeah. and it ties us to our history. But actually, it's sort of, it's not, the main species historically is it it's not no no it's not that, well it, it 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 depends and this is one of the problems uh, about the landscape that it 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 became one of the dominant species not just in terms of woodland but in terms of hedgerow tree it became dominant uh, and that dominance has been long lived so it's kind of it is part of a central part of our cultural landscape and in a sense it's a central part of our natural landscape because the sort of things that eat oak, live off oak, live in oak, are major parts of our natural landscape because of that. Except I've used the word natural and didn't mean to because <laughs> it's not a natural landscape. It's a heavily cultural landscape. And that, 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 that's important. I mean, it's important. Oak has an important role for all those reasons. Now, it isn't a dominant or wouldn't be a dominant of the natural landscape, its reason why it's so common is straight economic technological reasons. It's, mm. it, 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 it works very easily when it's green, it grows pretty quickly, uh, and it makes fantastic structural timber. Mm. So it's the obvious choice. So everything was built of oak. Ships, houses, made of structural timbers in houses. But it's, it's not natural. It's the wrong way of thinking about it. You're quite right. Yeah, so was oak, was the amount of oak um, increased around the time when they were using more, doing more shipbuilding and sort of had more expansion in maybe in the Middle Ages and in, in sort of the Georgian period? Was, that, did, was there a sort of a shift or a deliberate shift towards greater planting of oak in the landscape? Yeah, they talk about it. I mean, I don't know is the simple answer to that. In, in the medieval period, already it's a standard building material. Yeah, I, I just think it's a good material to build with. But it's not just oak. The other interesting thing is that if you go back through timber surveys, of which there are many from the 16th century onwards, a few medieval ones, uh, oak, ash and elm in almost all areas make up 80, 90, 95, 100% of the trees recorded. So an absolute dominance of those three. Um, so... Uh, maple hardly figures, for example. But if you if you allowed if you allowed land to just regenerate naturally, maple would be better represented. Maple is not present as a tree in the landscape uh, because they got no real use for it. Mm. Oak, ash, elm all have specific, very important uses. That doesn't mean there's no other trees, but all the other trees have specialised uses. So, for example, uh, hornbeam is very good charcoal. It's very, very good for making mallets and breaks on carts. For example, um, alder is it is very resistant to to rot when it's underwater. So it's very good for wharfs and, and jetties mm. good for charcoal too actually so everything has a specific use but the what we think of as our kind of natural countryside and the trees in the natural countryside is actually entirely shaped by or well, primarily by economic and technological processes yeah and aren't there lots of species that came <coughs> in as introductions as well whether in the sort of in victorian period as a kind of fashion oh loads Absolutely loads of stuff comes in. And in the 18th century too. But also earlier, I mean, there are trees which whose status is debated. So sycamore, for example. There's a very strong argument for saying that sycamore is, is introduced in the late Middle Ages. But there's a quite a good argument. He's saying it wasn't, and it's actually a minority indigenous tree. Mm. But you're right, lots of things get... I mean, almost all the conifers do. In fact... Strictly speaking, all the conifers probably get introduced in the post-medieval period because Scots pine, which is indigenous to Scotland, was once present in England but appears to have died out at the end of the Roman period mm. for reasons no one can explain. And as far as you can tell, gets reintroduced in the 16th or 17th century. Oh, really? What, so there were no pine trees even in Scotland? No, there were in Scotland, reintroduced to England. Oh, in England. Say. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's a place not far from, from here, Summer Leighton, where 
in the 1650s, the garden there, people go for miles around to visit the garden because there's one component of the garden which is planted with Scots pines. And mm. they just think it's amazing. You know, it's like, I mean, that would mean nothing now. Mm. So, yeah, there are a lot of introductions. But as you, you're quite right, as you move through the 18th into the 19th century, lots of them, partly for commercial forestry, but often for for aesthetic reasons in gardens and parks. Mm. I think people also think that we've cut down lots of trees and, and reduced the amount of woodland over time. And actually, that's really not the case either, is it? And there's sort of a great fluctuation over the centuries in increase and reduced tree cover. Uh, it's not the case at all. It's uh, and, and one of the things which, which people get quite cross about when I say it, but it, but it is absolutely true, is that roughly speaking, in the last century, we've doubled the area of woodland. In doubled? England. Doubled. That would be reasonable. We're uh, probably more than doubled. We've gone from about... The earliest reliable government estimates, I think, in 1895. In fact, they're not estimates. They're actual kind of survey things. And that suggests, if you total up all the counties, it's 4.5%, a bit over, probably, over the land surface of England. Mm. I mean, it's difficult because it's what you class as a wood and how close the trees yeah, are to be. Yeah. But that's reasonable. But now we're about 10. Okay. Now, partly that is to do with the Forestry Commission, planting all those conifers. Um, but actually, if you look at how, if you follow the government statistics through, it, the real increase has come after the 1920s, 30s, when the main forestry plantations have been created. And a lot of it is to do with spontaneous woodland regeneration mm. on areas which were grazed. So common land, uh, heaths, that kind of thing, regenerating to woodland from the woodland, which probably to some extent originally covered them in the first place. So it does raise interesting questions, and in some cases, interesting questions about what is natural. Can I can I add lib for a minute? You can do. Right. Grab the uh, microphone. And make sure it's <coughs> no, it's yeah. quite... Eh? Is that make right? sure the, yeah, make sure it's pointing up. Mate, like well, uh, the good, the story I always tell... Um, people, is there's a place just outside Norwich called Mousehold Heath. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mousehold Heath. No. Mousehold Heath um, was, uh, if you look up on that map there, but the visitor can't, it's the big yellow blob to the northeast of Norwich. Oh, uh, yeah, there, yeah, the Heath. Whopping great area, right? Mousehold Heath is painted in by artists of the Norwich School in the early 19th century, and they're very fond of it as a, as a place to paint. And it's utterly treeless, completely treeless, it's uh, got a windmill on it and it's all very scuffed up and heathery and, and it looks, looks lovely, but it's heath. Heath. Heather, gorse, grasses, occasional bush, no trees. Now, that's as it's stated in the 17th, 18th century. It was the place where Ket's rebels massed before their attack on Norwich in, in whichever year it was. Now, fast track back, mouse hold... The, the, the element hold comes from, 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 from halt, meaning a wood. There's some very, very good correspondence between the Bishop of Norwich uh, and his land agent, effectively, in modern parlance, from the, uh, from the 13th century, early 13th century, basically saying, what are we going to do about mousehold wood? Because the tenants have a right to take free use of the timber and the wood from the common, and they're just stripping it. So it's a wood, it's under threat, it's degenerating. By the time you get to the end of the 13th century, nobody talks about mousehold wood anymore. It's mousehold heath, so it's an artefact. Now, most of that gets enclosed in the 19th century. The rump of it stays near Norwich. It's no longer grazed. It begins to regenerate naturally to woodland. Sycamore, a lot of it, but oak and, and, and ash and stuff. So it regenerates, becomes woodland. Occasionally, conservation groups go in to clear some of that vegetation to restore the heath, uh, where they are accosted by the local residents and uh, accused of destroying the natural vegetation. <laughs> now, the question then arises, what is the natural vegetation of Mousehold Heath? Yeah. Is it the original wood, which was itself no doubt already incredibly modified by grazing and exploitation? Was it the heath? Heath's now majorly valued as a as a resource because there's not that many heath and much heath in it. Or is it the spontaneous woodland regeneration, which includes sycamore, a tree of dubious uh, indigenous character? What is it? And the yeah. answer is, well, it's none of it, is it? It's or it's none, all of yeah. it. I mean, well, well, what do we this, mean? It's a word. Yeah, well, it's this 
constant use of the word natural, isn't it, really? That especially it seems to be fashionable now and there's sort of a constant appeal to nature in sort of in the media and in advertising, this kind of thing, that natural and nature is good. But to define what actually is natural in terms of the landscape is almost impossible. Oh, God, yeah. And, and that's particularly true from a landscape point of view because if, you were, if we were having this conversation in the 18th century and we we're talking about creating a natural landscape, what you and I would both be thinking of would be Capability Brown and his parklands. Now, his parklands are smooth, manicured, mm. um, carefully planted with a limited number of trees, some exotic trees near the house, an artificial lake. And, of course, there weren't many lakes in England before Brown started putting them in parks. Completely unnatural. And, indeed, what is natural is a major argument in the 18th century because a lot of people don't like Brown. They say it's boring, it's bland, it's vapid, it's just pointless. What you need to do is rough it up a bit. So the picturesque advocates, um, people like uh, Overdale Price and Richard Payne Knight, they say, oh, you don't want that. You want boulders and you want, you know, more variety and detail and stuff. So even then, it's uh, it's a contested term and it's even... Well, the trouble is perhaps it's contested now, but perhaps it isn't contested enough. Perhaps mm. we all think we know what we mean by it and therefore don't have to bother with the tricky business of defining it. Yeah, well, that's why I think people like yourself are so important in offering that perspective of saying look, that actually there is a sort of debate about what natural means and that it's changed over, over history and over time. Um, and it's sort of aligned itself with fashion a lot more mm. than any sort of objective truth of what actually is sort of indigenous, I suppose, in any way. Yeah. Um, and sort of in t moving on then in terms of fashions, obviously the latest trend is rewilding. Yeah. There's sort of more talk about this. Yeah. Um, and this is an area I'm particularly interested in yeah, because I'm too. not entirely sure yet what the sort of appropriate response to it is or whether it's a good thing i thought it was a good thing but i'm not sure about whether there's more nuance in it and whether there's sort of a lot of questions that it raises and a lot of, sort of philosophical and historical questions about and i suppose practical as well in terms of sort of farming about whether it's a good thing or not and in certain, certain circumstances or not and what the sort of consequences of it are or might be you you've just said everything i would have said i think <laughs> I, th I think i think the issue is the first issue is that it is a it is a fashion, it is a fad, and it's it's one of those phrases used, which isn't again often not defined. So rewilding can sometimes mean taking a nature reserve and roughing it up a bit, and sometimes it can mean reintroducing wolves into large areas of Upland Britain. You mm. know, well that was how it started with was it Yellowstone? Was it? <coughs> yeah, with yeah. the with the wolves and the famous story of changing the rivers and this kind of thing. Absolutely, but it, 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 in an English context, you know, you, you could be you could mean nep, you know, where you just yeah. let a whole estate go wild, and uh, or it could mean you know different scales and different extents. So that's one of the problems I have when you when you're even starting to discuss it. Um, but the main the main one I think is context. I, I I can see the value of rewilding in certain contexts. I don't see it as a panacea to the problems of biodiversity challenge in in mm. in the UK. And I think we're going to be in a lot of trouble if we don't think very hard about what we're doing before we start doing it. And the place I would start is with the simple statement that rewilding, if by rewilding we mean fencing off an area and, and perhaps introducing some major predators, but otherwise letting it look after itself, is almost entirely meaningless as a, as a proposal for two main reasons. The first is you're not recreating anything that was originally there. You are creating, a. it would be another construct. Mm. It would be another form of cultural landscape because, as you said earlier, lots of introductions have been made. Lots of animals have been introduced. Various animals are now extinct. It's a completely different collection of stuff you would be starting with. So... My guess would be in many in many circumstances, a sycamore would take off massively. Now, as I said earlier, it's a debate about whether it's indigenous or not, but it would get a head start because of the, the of the circumstances it's starting from. Uh, so it's not you're not creating anything that was once there. There's a George Peterkin, um, who you may know, uh, who's a, a writer on on woodland history. Right. Great, very very good. Very. Uh, has some great things, but he he talks about three kinds of nature. He talks about past nature, 
present nature and future nature. So past nature is the nature as it was at some point in the past, perhaps before human interventions, which would take us back a hell of a long way. I and mean, we would take us yeah, back a very long way, yeah. before, certainly before the last glaciation. I mean, the entire, the entire um, uh, flora and fauna of this country, is, as we have it now, has basically evolved with humans. The long period of hunter-gatherers, they're still modifying the landscape. They still took it out main predators. They're still, you know, etc. But past nature. There's present nature, which is nature as we perceive it today, which is itself as we've seen contested. And there's future nature. But future nature is what would happen, according to Peter Kinn, if you just remove mountains from the scene. But as he says, that wouldn't get you back to past nature because we've done too much modification. Yeah. Too much stuff's come in. Too much has been introduced. So that, that the second issue, I said there were two, the second big issue is, is to do with context and where you would do it and the practicalities. And, and, and the two things are related because the, one of the main areas suggested for rewilding would be um, the highlands of England, the upland areas of England, Moorland in particular. And George Monbiot is very good on this. And I understand the arguments. I understand that they are moderately poor <laughs> biodiversity, uh, etc. And it probably would be good in terms of flooding and runoff and all that to, to get some trees going. But actually, over large areas of, of the upland moors, the real threat is rhododendron. It's an introduced species. It wasn't there originally. There are parts of upland England that if you actually did just fence off and leave to their own devices, would become a rhododendron thicket 20 miles across. So, so in other words, rewilding can't really be leaving things to its own devices. You would have to manage yeah. significantly. So well, it's a bit of a myth. You are creating something. Secondly, you're not recreating anything that was ever once there. What you'd be mm. doing would be to take... Um, what we've got, which is an, an, an amalgam of, of, of culturally conditioned stuff, um, bits and pieces created by Victorian gardening fads or uh, medieval hunting. I mean, the rabbit. You know, some of, our, some of our key species are introduced and we're so familiar, we forget about them. So we think about grey squirrel. Right? We don't think about rabbit. The rabbit see, there are both, certainly one, almost certainly both species are utter introduced. Mm. They're, they're not indigenous. And you could just go on with that list. So leaving that amalgam of stuff that we've introduced to its own devices might have terrible consequences which are poor for biodiversity. If they were good for biodiversity, it would only be through a lot of management anyway. So yeah. there's a basic philosophical contradiction at the heart of it. Well, that's, I think, where you have to try and take it one step back effectively and say the goal necessarily isn't directly rewilding, it's increased mm -hmm. biodiversity. Yeah. If that is indeed the correct goal to go for, and I think it probably is um a, a sort of the, a general increase in biodiversity as a goal in itself and then trying to assess means to achieve that whatever which ones were better and which ones are worse over particular periods of time i understand that argument and i think the counter argument there's a number of counter arguments to that but the f one which we'll come back to so you better remind me to come back to it is that again it's a case of of proportion and how much you mm. do because landscapes and this is my main one of my main worries that the the real profits of biodiversity of uh, sorry rewilding assume that the only function of a landscape is to provide um biodiversity <clears throat> the only purpose of the stuff out there is is to be good for wildlife now mm. obviously i'm enthusiast for wildlife and i'm a great believer in biodiversity but there are other values landscapes have and we'll yeah. come back to that but the second issue the other issue on that is that i don't think there's been sufficient scientific rigorous scientific work making the point that there is necessarily higher levels of levels of biodiversity in unmanaged landscapes than in managed ones mm. or rather they might be Biodiversity is a difficult phrase because that's, again, what things that people aren't very good at defining. Do we mean more species per square metre? Do we mean that an ability to sustain species which otherwise would not exist? Mm. What do we mean? What do we actually mean in, in context? And the example I would give would be this, that if you contrast rewilding with agribusiness arable farming, obviously rewilding scores best. 
if you compare rewilding with kinds of, of landscapes managed under traditional, which is a word I hate to use, but long-term familiar processes, then how does that stack up? Is that different, for example? Mm. So if you take something like heathland, for example, or um, a lot of a lot of, um, of peatlands, they traditionally were managed in a way, as indeed were most traditional managements, which involved constant disturbance um, and truncating reaching climax always. So heathland uh, is not just left to its own devices. It's intensively grazed by sheep. It's intensively grazed by rabbits, often on specialised rabbit farms, which involves constant disturbance and, and, and mucking around. Um, it is a major fuel source, so it's dug. And when they're burning something like heather, they're stripping the heather and burning the roots. Uh, it never gets more than a bush on it because of the intensity of grazing. So you're doing really, you know, rigorous things to it. But because of that, it creates a habitat which is particularly good for certain things. Um, particularly uh, reptiles, actually, I and mean, particularly good. Now, I would like to see a bit of scientific research which took a bit of intensively managed heathland and said, well, let's if we compare that with rewilded area, what are we getting from the rewilded area which is better? Now, it might say, and I'm sure you would find, that you've got more species on the rewilded area. You know, mm. Trees things coming up, more stuff. But would you have as much of the stuff that's being produced on the heath? The answer is no, you wouldn't. Yeah. And so would the overall levels of that stuff, if everywhere was re-rolled, decline? Now, I'm not a scientist, I don't know the answers to that, but those are the questions people should be asking. Yeah, well, I think there's a sort of the general psychology about it is that there's this idea that we've, as a species, have disturbed the natural world and we're sort of alien visitors to this planet have come in and disturbed this sort of base level of constant sustainability and that there we need to somehow return to that static level of, of yeah. the landscape and the nature. Well, when actually a sort of history only happens once effectively, doesn't it? That there's a constant shift in what's in a particular landscape at any given time and what species are moving around different yeah. parts of the continents and this kind of thing, no, 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 when, what the when climate's was, doing, all this kind of stuff. But when was this time? I mean, this is what I, again, I don't understand. I don't understand when this time was. Are we going back before the last glaciation? Because because by the time... By the time we get to the last glaciation, you've had the megafauna extinctions. So, and, and I know there's a lot of debate about that, but by and large, as a general agreement, that's anthropogenic. Now, by the time you move into the Mesolithic, into the post-glacial hunter-gatherers, they're armed with fast, with high-velocity projectiles. They're armed with bows and arrows. Now, that clearly makes a major difference mm. on, on, on. So, uh, and as evidence for systematic burning of woodland in the Mesolithic, you know, they're clearing areas, probably round water sources to attract game. You know, it's a heavily modified landscape even mm. then. So, I don't quite understand when this wonderful time was back in mm. in the past. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is we have to live in the real world. Yeah. The real world is uh, what's the prediction for them? How many billion? people? people we're supposed to feed quite soon um at the moment what do we produce 40 percent of our own food um uh, people will say oh well you know that's fine we can keep importing our own food but i'd like to see how the geopolitics of that going to work long term yeah well you know, there are other we're a very very small island with a very high and a rapidly increasing pointlessly ridiculously increasing population somehow or other we're talking about how putting significant areas of land down to non-food producing use uh, 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 you know, rewilding just on that mathematics is always going to be limited. Mm. Most well, land's going to be farming. Well, that's sort of, but that leads back to the different kinds of land use that you mentioned earlier. That if the goal is to increase biodiversity generally in all areas and also continue to have productive land mm. that is producing food in one form or another, mm. how can you sort of integrate those things? Yeah. Because obviously at NEP they've got... Um, a number of longhorn cattle yeah. um, that you can get small amounts of meat from, but presumably that's nothing compared to what you could get from an intensively grazed no. farm. Um, and sort of how do you, if you're say you're a policy person coming out, how do you sort of advance the the causes of biodiversity within the landscape as it is now without losing productive land effectively? Well, I think, and in a sense. The, the 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 way you're asking the question gives the answer. The answer is we've got limited resources. 
So we have to think about ways of maximizing diversity. Part of the way of maximizing diversity will be through rewilding certain areas. I mean, it's not saying it's got a place. Clearly, it's got a place. That's that's absolutely fine. Another way of maximizing diver biodiversity, but not necessarily in terms of counting species per square meter, but just encouraging habitats for things that are valuable, would be to uh, maintain or restore forms of traditional very 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 long term management which would evolve particular ecosystems I mean, that seems to be perfectly doable so to go back to heathland it would be a tragedy if all the heaths were given over to rewilding that would be a disaster it seems to me because you mm. would be losing so and then and other things you need to do you need to think about the more um diffuse landscape of agricultural land uh, away from specialised areas like heaths and fens, but, you know, pasture and arable. Uh, now, traditionally, high levels of biodiversity were maintained on that by the fact there was a, a very, very fine-grained mesh of hedgerows. Now, that would no longer be feasible because of agribusiness farming, but we could put back one hell of a lot of hedgerows without mm. any interference at all just on roadsides. That would be a plus, that you could do that. Yeah. I've two other... Major objections to what biodiversity, uh, uh, well, possibly three. A lot of it, it seems to me, is driven by not by this kind of hard accounting, as it were, but by an emotional thing, mm. the call of the wild, yeah, the wolf howling in the in the wilderness and all that, um, which is fine. I understand that. I understand that appeal. But those kind of areas in England aren't going to be uh, round here. You know, they're going to be, almost certainly, the main targets for rewild, it will have to be the least productive land in the uplands, mm. for distance. Now, that's fine for people like you and me, who are mobile, who have got cash, and have got cars, and can afford train fares. Right? But most people don't experience nature like that. Most people experience nature in their gardens, on a walk in the countryside, at the end of their road, yeah. etc. And and all one of the main worries I've got about Bardo, about rewilding is it's become such a mantra that it's almost like we're taking the eye off the ball of the stuff that really matters. Mm. You know that stuff matters as well. Yeah. Well, there's a sort of I think there's a kind of romanticisation, especially by people who've grown up and live in cities of nature as this sort of pure pristine thing yeah. that you go out to and i mean you see constantly in sort of sci-fi films where you've got some futuristic city and then yeah. outside of the walls this wild landscape that you just traverse and go to for recreation occasionally and i think a lot of people in cities seem to have that view of the countryside yeah i think i think that's the trouble i, th I think re the one of the thing is that's that's firing rewilding is the urbanization of the population. Mm. I think that's absolutely right. I think they don't react, you know, it's not quite clear what the countryside's about. It's like, you know, like if we all go vegan, that's going to be good for the countryside. Of course, bloody not going to be good for the countryside. What's going to graze anything? You know, most of the key environments in the country are grazed environments. If we all stopped eating meat, we'd be absolutely stuffed. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. There is that, that kind of emotional thing and, and a slight misunderstanding, I guess, about the kind of what how man-made the countryside is but that's fine it's just the worry is there's a sort of slightly privileged aspect to it mm. you know it's fine for for george monbiot yeah you can get there you know some old lady can't and the birds on the bird table are are important the, the kind of environments created in urban areas are important mm. it's not that there aren't isn't any nature in the town it's a different kind of nature there was a brilliant book written by, oh, what was he called? Oh, dear. It's going to look bad on the podcast, isn't it? <laughs> That's all right. The Flowering of the Cities, it was called. And it was okay. showing how every city has a different ecology on its wild land, mm. on its sort of scrub. Part but there was a good one I read called Edgelands. Oh, yeah, um, and Marion Short. Yeah. And yeah. It's, I mean, you see this in London a lot. You can, if you really sort of pause for a second and take the time... Um, I, I sort of say this, my background is I grew up in rural Hampshire and now I live in London. Um, if you pause, you really see a lot of nature in certain yeah. areas. And I'm particularly interested as, as an architect as well in the the um, greenification or the, the 
introduction of more biodiversity and more natural systems into urban areas yeah. and suburban areas. Yeah. So how do you think the sort of landscape history is relevant to that? And have there been any sort of good examples, I suppose, or, or good or bad examples of how people have managed to integrate um, urban areas? And, and well, I mean, there's a long history of that in terms of things like... Uh, um, Ebenezer Howard and the Garden City movement of integrating the countryside and, and the town. And again, obviously, he confused the countryside with natural. <clears throat> um, I don't know. There's not enough done. I mean, suburban landscapes are very interesting, partly because the way they preserve more of the rural landscape than most people would imagine. So, you mm. know, roadside hedges and things like that, uh, trees, you know, do survive right through. But the other is the, the the kind of spontaneous nature that comes out of those environments. Well, and as I say, the, the book is not, I can't remember the name of the book. I mean, his point was that even in this, even in different cities had different kinds of flora and fauna on their waste grounds, partly because of of, of natural factors, geology, soils, and that, but also because they're a history. So in Sheffield, for example, one of the things you get in Sheffield is you get mature fig trees growing along the edge of the river but you never get any young ones and the reason being that there was a very short period of time when people were eating figs <laughs> the figs went down the sewers into the river but because of the steelworks the river was warm enough for them to germinate yeah but when the steelworks are gone they no longer did so they will eventually they're transient they will eventually go well i think that's absolutely fascinating from a historical point of view mm. it's kind of wonderful things but why are those environments not also important you know, I, it seems to me these are all versions of nature. And the idea that the rewilding is the only version of nature that matters is in some way, quite spiritually in my view, more natural than any of the others, I don't quite get. Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to this whole thing of the constant shifting of, of natural history, really, isn't it? And like I've, I constantly see parakeet populations in and around London. Mm. Um, and people sort of look at them and think, oh, they're, they're unnatural. Mm. Um, but why shouldn't there be a parakeet population in the south of England? And why shouldn't there be um, populations of all kinds of other creatures that have been introduced or finding their way into this ecosystem and making a, a reasonable contribution? Yeah, difficult though, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I agree up to a point. It's just that when you get, you know, mink. Yeah. When what, they start interfering yeah, with what's here seriously and become seriously involved, or rhododendron in many contexts, you know, that becomes problematic. Um, and actually... You know, arguably, before myxomatosis, rabbits have become seriously problematic. Rabbits is one of my great interests <laughs> um, because, you know, the rabbit was rare in the countryside until the 18th century. There's no doubt mm. about it. Rabbit is, is a farmed animal, semi-domestic, certainly until the 17th. And, and the transformation of large areas of lowland England by enclosure, um, this spread of hedgerows, but above all, the, the shift in the nature of cropping so that you have crops like turnips and clover, particularly turnips, growing in the fields over winter means the rabbit populations rise. But then people quite soon forget the rabbit. By that stage, the rabbit's become natural because we don't, people have forgotten that it's, you know, that it's in, introduced. Yeah. But other things too, it's, sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but it's a good, good example of the close connection between you know, practical agricultural, very, very man-made change and our perceptions of of, of what is the normal wildlife? So if you take wood pigeon, wood pigeon, I mean, people use the term wood pigeon. We never, never, people don't stop thinking, well, we don't live in woods. We don't really live in woods. It is everywhere. There's wood pigeons all over the place. Wood pigeon is really rare in, in the 17th century. It's not a common animal at all. And we know that because of the list of animals you are allowed to, to get to be paid by the church wardens to kill under the 1597 Protection of Grain Act, which is all the stuff that preys on the grain. We don't mention wood pigeon. Right? Mm. Wood pigeons massively increase in the 18th century, the same reason the rabbits do. There's, there's, there's green fodder in the fields. So that then gets you to a bigger question, which is what we think of as the normal balance of bird life in England. Is that Would that be different if the whole of England if the whole of England was rewilded because we all died? And the answer is, yes, it would. Because the kinds of, of animals that live in woodland and wood pasture, kind of birds that live, are different. So is that, does the, so every stage of shifting and changing the environment 
shifts the baseline, as they say, you know, you change your view, of, but it, it, it defines what is natural. Mm. So it's much more problematic, I think, than rewilding will accept. That's one point. And the second point is, I think rewilding is very appropriate and a very useful tool in very difficult times. But if it becomes the main driver, we may take our eye off the other probably more important ball, balls for maintaining biodiversity. Yeah. Well, it's I suppose it's difficult because there's a... I suppose America is the worst example of this, of agriculture and intensive farming effectively going too far and becoming monocultures mm. and sort of and destroying any kind of biodiversity. Like mm. you, in this country, you can talk about sort of rare species going mm. out of, in, in agricultural animals, even yeah. going out um, and becoming extinct or going out of fashion and not being maintained effectively. Yeah. Um, but on the more sort of the natural um, side, can we, are there ways we can stop our farming effectively having the bad effects of intensive farming and of monocultures really easy i mean you could easily do it and i mean I, there's an awful lot could be done really quite quickly I, I i absolutely strongly think this and i think you just mucking around with the grant system would do an awful lot uh i would look much more carefully at the field edge margin stuff the field edge margins are a great principle and if a, a bit more rigorously done, would be beneficial. I think I think planting of small woodland, planting of farmland trees, planting of hedges would do an awful lot of good too. Mm. I think creation of ponds would massively increase biodiversity. Uh, but that sort of stuff, particularly on urban fringes, when I would actually props, you know, there's an argument for saying where most people can access this stuff is where most of the investment should be directed. Uh, I think would transform stuff quite quite radically. Uh, within that matrix, you might have areas which you did just leave to, to on a sort of small scale rewild. You know, mm. bit of rubbish soil, just leave it and see what happens. Um, that wouldn't preclude having intensive agriculture, more intensive agriculture in, in in other areas. I mean, I just think it needs something more than a simple alternative of rewilding or intensive agriculture. And I think because I'm an old fashioned. Uh, socialist i think it needs some planning mm. i think you know it really does need some thought and some planning and we've lost the concept of spatial planning in this country i think to a large extent it's become entirely reactive um and and a bit useless really uh, it, it's just a case of who can get the most money into an inquiry to get the thing shifted one way or the other there's no overall scheme go back into the 20th century you know think of the town and country planning uh, 1947 act it was a brilliant bit of legislation in my part, I perhaps you disagree. But I think just to think, you can't have London spreading all the way to Bedford. Yeah, you know, we've no, got... it's a great policy. The Greenbelt policy is fantastic. Policy. It's fantastic. Yeah. And of course, needless to say, a Labour Party policy. Mm. You know, it's not the sort of thing a free market person would have come up with because he's obviously completely out of the free market. That's why we get into politics now. But I do think these are political issues. Yeah. Well, they're important, in ter especially in terms of subsidies, aren't they, when it comes to landscape? Yeah. And this is sort of... <clears throat> the key issue of the day at the moment with the removal of the common agricultural policy yeah yeah or suspected removal and the transition to whatever comes after that we haven't escaped yet we haven't escaped yet no but the, i think and this is one thing um i think george monbiot mentions is removal of the subsidy for things like upland sheep farming and effectively unsustainable or financially unsustainable farming practices mm. um and what would be the effects of those sort of in terms of the landscape and in terms of the the ecology as well and is there still going to be a role for subsidies in certain areas and to what degree and how do you stop those running away and becoming unaffordable is there are there ways of rather than subsidizing say the use of field margins can you incentivize farmers to want to set aside land uh th through some other means well i mean we're gonna have to because of the major concerns, the really serious concerns and aspects of biodiversity loss, which are things like uh, pollinating insects. You mm. know, there will be a drive. Some of this stuff is going to have to happen or we are all absolutely screwed. So, uh, and in things like um, if the recent targets they've been talking about, about tree planting, that can't all go in woods. That's going to have to be field margin stuff. That's going to have to be roadside stuff. There's going to have to be an awful lot of planting. So I, in some ways, I'm kind of slightly optimistic because I do think that when it comes to the real crunch and you are looking at serious impacts on agricultural productivity, 
there that's the point you're pushing an open door yeah. but obviously that's different from biodiversity but i am sorry from rewilding but i just want to take take up on something a bit all the conversation we've had so far has has been in a sense shaped by the agenda um created by the rewilding people mm. i can't go on with this because there's two people peering through the door bugger mm. off <laughs> bugger Got off some visitors um and that is all about biodiversity as if the only thing in the countryside that matters to humans yeah, right. is the wildlife now to me all that stuff matters unbelievably but there are other aspects of the landscape which which rewilding will tr would potentially transform so uh, i'll give you an example simple example if Landscape has all sorts of things. Landscape has history. Landscape has cultural history. Landscape gives us our, our sense of national identity, arguably. Landscape could be art. Mm. So if you were to take a capability brown landscape, a well-preserved one, uh, Petworth or somewhere like that, uh, or Kimberley near here, it smooth, unnatural, manicured, means something as a kind of minimalist simplicity to do with yeah, neoclassical yeah. ideas, you know, all this stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, all the, the bucolic view and the picturesque and the sublime. Absolutely, and kind of but yeah, it's yeah. a particular version of that, because I said earlier, they will argue, you know, at the time about where what's picturesque and what isn't, but it's a particular point of time where the ideal landscape design is one of minimalist simplicity and, and bringing out the raw topography. That's what brown does. I mean, arguably the lakes are to accentuate the contour. You see yeah. And I, I personally see a lot of this as being to do with the rise of neoclassicism in architecture. I think. No, it is, absolutely. Yeah, and, it is. And, and, and brown was a neoclassical a classical architecture. I mean, places like Benham, Barrington. Um, but those are important landscapes. Important. If you were to rewild it, I would leave it. You know, cut a, put a cat on it. Right? Otherwise, we won't do anything. We'd big, big fence around it. That to me would be a terrible loss. Yeah, well, you'd lose that, lose the history of that place. Wouldn't you'd you? lose the history of that. Well, now that is the most interesting thing of all because what people said about Brown, the great criticism of Brown, is he negated character so that everywhere came to look the same. That was one of the criticisms because right. he's working on this idealized, idealized, idealized concept of natural landforms and natural nature, which suppresses regional idiosyncrasy. So, for example, most famously, Anik in Northumberland, he removes the boulders from around the castle mm. to make it smooth. Fine. But doesn't that remind you a bit of rewilding? What, allowing... Allowing everything to look like wood look pasture. Same. Maybe. I don't know. I think well, the trouble, trouble is it's not been tried in enough places. Like, is it, I've just finished reading um, Isabella Tree's book about net. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to see, firstly, how deliberate it was. It wasn't sort of, oh, let's just stop farming and see what happens. Mm. It was, let's actively do sort of make an effort and apply for subsidies to restore particular soil conditions and plant particular species and allow particular species to yep. go around. So it is effectively designed landscape. Yeah, effectively it is designed, yeah. Um, so it's not really wild. No, but then you can also... I, th I don't think it's possible to... I don't know, to to ever have anything that is really wild. You do have to design it to some extent. And but that's why I go back to the idea of the biodiversity as the, the goal, not uh, sort of a... Uh, an attempt at becoming wild, effectively. So rewilding is kind of the wrong word. Um, yeah, it, it is. But but wait a minute, wait a minute, slow down a minute. <laughs> the, there's, there's a whole number of different points there, isn't it? One is, one is again, what did you mean by biodiversity? Because if if we allowed great chunks of England to become lightly grazed woodland, wood pasture, um, that would limit certain species. Mm. You know, not everything likes living in wood pasture. Yeah. There are certain things which like open heathland. There's certain things like downland. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know enough about it, but I'm not quite sure how stone curlews would get on in a yeah. well wooded environment. Okay, so so in terms of <clears throat> suppressing variation and difference, I suspect it would. That was the analogy I was thinking with, with brown. But just to go back to the brown landscape. So what we're saying is. A brown landscape is so important in cultural historical terms. If it's well preserved and good, we wouldn't really select that for rewilding. Yeah, we say it. so. We are saying there are limits to rewilding, which are being well. Conditioned. You're putting the the architectural and historical <coughs> value of that particular yeah. thing 
uh, over the value that might be yeah. gained from any other intervention, effectively, yeah. aren't you? Okay, so we could then extend that, I suppose, to what would we think about places which were not in themselves designed, but were the subject of, of artistic or literary representation. So, for example, Dead and Vale. Constable painted Dead and Vale endlessly, and those, those, those are very wonderful paintings. Have you ever been to Flatford Mill? No. It's absolutely side-splittingly funny because what they do, you know those constable paintings yeah, of yeah, Nottingham's yeah, yeah. house yeah. and all that. You go to the particular viewpoint and they've tried to manage it so it returns. Oh, to really? Like, about to, to match the painting? Yeah. Now, That's find, a weird inversion, isn't it? Uh, uh, yeah, mind-bogglingly weird. Absolutely <laughs> mind-bogglingly weird. But would you select those views for rewilding? Mm. Or are well, they so part of our culture? Obviously, they're part of our culture because people go and visit there and want to see the reconstructed versions. Now, I would say I would really be very, very uneasy about Dead and Vale being left to its own devices. Mm. Well, yeah, again, well, it's, just, it's a constant sort of balancing of values, isn't it? About in what particular case is a particular cultural, uh, I don't know, example, or example of culture or art or yep. whatever it is or history yeah. more valuable than what otherwise might be achieved. Yeah, and you have to sort of make that assessment. You do at different times, and it yeah. can, I guess it can apply to whole landscapes as well. It, it can indeed, and and that in a sense is my 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 contribution to the debate, such as it is, and it isn't much really. Would merely be to say, let's take this really slowly. Let's not just buy it out. I mean, I go to conferences when I go to conferences. And I'm the only person. Next week, I'll be at Hallam. I'll be the only person at the Hallam conference, I'm sure, saying anything cautious. The rest of it is always wonderful. Go get cracking. Let's rewild everything, you know. And I'm not so sure it's as simple as that. I'm not at all sure it's as simple as that. Let's go a bit further. Right? We've got the Upland the Upland Moors. Now, the Upland Moors, they, they of all places would be ripe for rewilding mm. for a whole bundle of reasons. And George Monbiot is absolutely right on that. I'm not... not I don't mean to criticise him, I think his work's wonderful, but on that he's certainly right. But even there, you know, those rugged, empty, stark, moorland landscapes have a value in people's psyche. You know, they have uh, you know, all that stuff. I'm a, you know, all day I'm a wage slave at the mill and by day I, by weekend I'm a free man on the moors, that kind of concept. The unobstructed far horizons. You know, that, that they, they're they wonderful places. You can tell how wonderful they are because everyone makes a beeline for them. Yeah, well, the Great Glen constantly reminds me every time I'm there of sort of this sort of effectively blank landscape, like mm. no trees, mm. as far as you can see. Mm. But people give it huge value still. They do. But then also, but you think about this sort of equivalent landscape somewhere like Yellowstone that is sort of forested or, or the remaining bits of the Caledonian forest mm. where, although I've noticed around various parts of Scotland, they've started fencing off areas yeah. from deer yeah. and starting to encourage the origin, original um, forest growth. Yeah. And do and would that be more valuable if, say, somewhere like the Great Glen was completely re, rewilded, so to speak, by allowing that kind of that kind of tree growth? It would depend how far it went, wouldn't it? I mean, I, I, the simple answer is I don't know. But what I am suspicious of is the missionary zeal of those who have who say... We certainly know best. Mm. Well, it's you know, a, these are contested landscapes, and mm. and 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 that's the other reason I'm slightly worried about the kind of the way some of the rewilding things go. If they're not careful, there'll be a reaction. Yeah, you know, if, if if there are certain particular areas of the landscape which are highly valued and people identify with, and I'm not entirely convinced that those are the ones you definitely necessarily want to rewild. I think you rewilding's fine, and I'm rewilding in a planned manner in certain areas chosen because they have least impact on all the other things that landscapes provide, whether that's food, employment, uh, uh, artistic stuff, cultural stuff, whatever it is. You select it. It's one of the th criteria by which you plan. It's not an overarching principle which everything else fits into. That's how I would put it. Yeah. Even from even from this p position of natural history, the imposition of natural history, there are certain very restricted... Um, areas where certain very restricted ranges of creatures live and if those were left to their own devices and not managed under the traditional manner those things would go so rewilding by definition can't just be a simple overarching all supreme way of management
Yeah. Well, again, whatever you do, whatever invent intervention you make, something some things are going to benefit from it, and other things are going to um, suffer from it, aren't they? So, you, I mean, the classic example you're mentioning, what would die out naturally? I always think of the panda. Like if the well, it's not the UK, obviously. No. Like any species that only eats one type of grass and only reproduces once every six years not deserves to become extinct, really, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so, and it wouldn't probably would be extinct by now if it wasn't for us trying to preserve it, perhaps. But then equally, you can argue that it wouldn't have but got near to extinction if it wasn't for us in the first place destroying no. habitat. So, but there's all kinds of ex subtle examples like that. And I guess in the UK, another example that comes to mind is the beaver, which is now on its way back in in terms of a few introduction schemes. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. Which is good in terms of increased biodiversity. But then mm. you say if you do too much, there's going to be a reaction. There's been a huge reaction from Probably. farmers against yeah. beavers already because of the potential for the da damage that they do um, and and sort of flooding farmland. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So it's about twenty things is coming to my brain as, you, as <laughs> you're talking. <laughs> well, one of them, one of them is is just in terms of the way that I sometimes think that conservationists. It's not going to go down well without listening to this. Uh, there is never a good story. You know, it's all, there's a sort of narrative built into conservation which intrinsically has to be negative because you're trying to conserve something. The implication is whatever you try to conserve is under threat mm. and you're conserving what's left of it. Right? That, that's fine. But it, it, it's quite strange the way that you kind of get somersaults of, of logic. Um, Within our own lifetime, within my lifetime, certain balances of species have changed dramatically. So actually, even when I came to East Anglia, badgers were rare. They're all over the roads. Roadkill badger is not an unusual sight. Mm. Uh, that would be an example. But the one I always think of is, is deer. Now, deer numbers, yep. uh, round here particularly, but I mean in across lowland England as a whole, have massively increased over the last hundred years. I mean, unbelievably increased over the last hundred years. Uh, even to the extent where in Norfolk, the Norfolk and Norwich Wildlife, uh, what are they called? Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society each year published, still publish, a list of mammals recorded in the county. And up until 1912, they don't count deer as wildlife. Really? There aren't any. They're all in parks. They're not wild. Well, even the native species. Even the native species. They're basically, the few that there are around here are basically in people's parks. Uh, 1912 is 19, 1902, so that's probably more reasonable. But the turn of the century. Then now, or the, uh, the other day, uh, I had to chase one out in the vegetable patch. <laughs> They're absolutely everywhere. Now, you would think that on one reading, the return of Britain's largest indigenous mammal or semi-indigenous case, the fallow, of course, yeah. because the fallow is yet another introduction, of course. But you would think that would be a cause of celebration. But mm. of course it isn't, because all you ever actually read is the terrible devastation being caused by deer on things like woodland flora. Yeah. Now, of course, it's causing devastation on woodland flora. It's causing devastation on woodland flora because woodland flora developed uh, characteristic ancient woodland flora in the only just about the only environment in medieval and early post-medieval England which wasn't regularly grazed. Mm. That's why you've got those particular ancient woodland indicator species. The only reason why you get massive bluebells in woods, they're highly susceptible to grazing pressure, right? Mm. So now the deer, so that's now what we worry about. But of course, actually, one wonders what the displays of bluebells would look like in a rewilded landscape. Yeah, well, there's... It would sort of be churned up by uh, wild boar and yeah, wild gr pigs. And, and grazed off by, grazed by, by, by yeah. cattle. I mean, it wouldn't, you know, so that would be an example that, that most people, if they think of nature, think of a bluebell wood. That's, yeah. you know, people go for miles to bluebell wood. Where, how does the bluebell wood f feature? Well, presumably a lot of people look at it and think it's really not very biodiverse. It needs to be changed and altered and improved in some way by having it trampled all over by a boar or grazed to smithereens by deer. No? Yet in some contexts, grazing to smithereens by deer is not a good thing, apparently. Yet in rewilding, it's fine. I mean, it just seems to be full of a lot of non sequiturs, mm. which always resolve to ultimately an emotional appeal. Yeah, well, I think you're right that it ultimately is an emotional um, agenda, if you like, and there's a there's a sort of 
a, a lack of understanding in the sort of the, the changing nature of, of the landscape and how much effect we have mm. on it, I think. Um, and uh, again, like this, this sort of idea of of biodiversity as the end goal. It's I, I'm I want to sort of figure out whether that is the ultimate goal, whether that is the best goal to aim. What for. do you mean? But again, what do you mean by biodiversity? Because well, that's yeah, an interesting well, tricky point, word. Yeah. Is it number of stuff per square meter of land, mm. or is it taking a, the country as a whole, or larger the country? Is it benefiting the maximum number of species? Because I don't think rewilding will necessarily do that. There's, I mean, there are... What happens... I'm out of my depth. What happens to the ground-nesting birds of downland, arable uh, and heath? Where do they live in a in an extensive wood pasture? Mm. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. But my guess is they don't do very well. But that doesn't ever seem to figure in any of the cost accounting about, because all it's ever compared with is rewilding versus intensive arable husbandry. Mm. It's a meaningless comparison. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really tricky issue, and I think... Yeah, it's a tricky issue because nobody wants to address it. They're not actually looking at... It just becomes a word, a slogan, an emotional appeal. Mm. And it doesn't... And... and and, and the other thing that slightly disturbs me about it at times, I went to, I was with Liz, my wife, walking up the northeast coast of Norfolk. I don't know if you know the coast of Norfolk. A little bit. We went yeah. up to the Horsey Gap. It was about three weeks ago, and we saw thousands of seals. I mean, literally thousands, but it was wonderful. And there were quite a lot of people looking at them, which is fine. And there was a, a, a Natural England or Wildlife Trust or something sign about keeping away from the seals. Uh, and someone had graffitied it and it just said, nature isn't theatre. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's right. But what is NEP? Yeah, well, that's, that's sort of where I think I link into the financial model. Because much as I like, I think, like a lot of what they've done there, it's now based financially on safaris so far as mm. i can tell mm, yes. and that works when there's one but it doesn't work if there were if every farm did that no say so how how can you have a sustainable financial model if you're a farmer if you try and do that everywhere it's never going to work no you, you couldn't i mean no absolutely yeah. and, so, it don't, and the other thing is the other thing is i think that annoys me a little because of my training and my trade is I am used to teaching the students about how to read and decode the intricate patterns in the landscape. So, you know, what do they mean historically? How can you distinguish a parliamentary enclosure uh, field pattern from one created in the medieval period? And indeed, you know, some of the field patterns in this country, uh, particularly uh, over southeast England, you know, will go back to the 12th century. Uh, arguably, some people, not me, but some people think there's quite substantial chunks of prehistoric and Roman landscapes embedded in all this. Mm. But it's a historical document of some significance and some importance. Now, the attitude of a rewilders to that would be that you really want to get rid of all that because, because the court of the wild, the feeling of wilderness, is not fostered by a view of hedges. So you basically neglect them, leave them, let them spread, let them get to predate or whatever till they've gone. So... So it's actually going with rewilding is a kind of year zero, wiping the slate clean, getting back to the thing before man was there, kind of involves, for the areas in which it's applied, cheery by history. Mm. And I, that I find understandable in certain locations. If, as you say, it's one of the great goods to be done. But how often have you ever heard anybody discussing rewilding take that into consideration? Yeah, I never have. Never. Well, it's sort of, it's like, I guess it's this idea of moving rather than having hedgerows and field boundaries, of moving to this sort of patchwork. I yeah, guess, absolutely. What I'm saying is, by doing that, the historical fabric of the fa of the landscape is destroyed. Yeah. So, you, would you argue that the value there's a significant value in that that shouldn't be neglected? I suppose you would as a as a historian. Well, I would, and I would be for other reasons too. I mean, people think uh, you know there is an attachment still between. Uh, the town and the countryside people think of the countryside as looking in a certain kind of way and that's that's you know not to be sniffed at there's there's centuries of artistic representations of it looking like that and that's not to be lightly ignored 
um the uh, the idea that you that everywhere is equally ripe for rewilding i think that's what i find most offensive that it clearly without full regard for the downsides Mm. Is is dodgy, and the idea is a panacea. It, it's dodgy. Uh, so the other thing that worries me slightly also is that there's something going on across Western Europe anyway, which is sort of spontaneous rewilding. Which is you've got cultural landscapes of some importance on marginal land developed over centuries, but then there's a drift from marginal land, and you know, like in the spread of wolves across parts of Europe, with yeah. with marginal land just re rewilding spontaneously rewilding villages being depopulated in parts of up in europe and parts of uh, uh, central france and the rest and concentration into the cities if we're not careful rewilding will feed into will give a justification for a land use change agenda being determined by technology population changes and the rest which will yeah. end up with mega cities intensely productive farmland with sod all in it and rewilded land which only people like you and me can get to yeah. and stay well, and have a look at zonification isn't it zonification. Your, your, your walled city with its hyper hyper intense sci-fi city yep. with your your national park over there and then your productive farm over there effectively yeah and that you, well you, actually the way the geography works the productive land would ring the city and the the outlying stuff would be miles away that and, sounds uh, like ebenezer howard's plan again <laughs> <laughs> but on a smaller scale. But there's a danger that we're feeding into something that's happening and may not actually be quite what we really want because mm. what we're going to end up with is is doing something which, again, is sort of inherent in the whole philosophy, and that is there is a divorce of man and nature. Mm. That, that, that yeah. long tradition of British ecologists, historical ecologists, like Oliver Rackham, um, uh, Oh, like Max Hooper, people like that, they saw human history and natural history as absolutely intertwined and the landscape as being a result of, of that yeah. and, and evidence for both. You know, that was that. And, and that we seem to be moving away from that. We seem to be saying that, that we can have nature, which has just left itself as humans that only part in, but we can kind of be voyeurs onto yeah. if we pay. Uh, but it's got to be kind of fairly big scale and it must be on the relative marginal land. So by definition, it's going to be quite a long way away. So it's going to be even further separated from our lives. Yeah. That's the concern. Yeah. Well, it's this sort of this othering effectively of nature, isn't yeah. it? Like there's me and my life and then there's nature, and which I go to at the weekend and then I come back to my real life rather than an integration. Yeah, yeah. And and, and to me, I mean, again, it sounds perhaps not politically okay but i'll say it anyway <laughs> sod it um it's it often comes as a package of other things too like attitude towards toward towards meat eating right mm. that that meat eating is somehow cruel so we shouldn't do it yet in a rewilded reserve with introduced reintroduced alpha predators what the fuck do you think is going to happen I mean, that is about things eating each other because that's what nature does nature eats itself right and we are going to be separate from that. So we live in the in the mega city, surrounded by purely arable farmland without any animals. We're all living some kind of vegan life, and then we have some strange wireistic relationship with nature when we go out on a safari. I don't want that. Yeah, it doesn't appeal. Well, well it's. Uh, I mean, I'm putting it's... an exaggerated case, obviously. No, no, no actually of wants that. But you well, see what I'm saying? There are ways in which the logic of the way geographies are moving, anyway. Yeah. He's fitting into that rewilding agenda in a way that might be uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, let me, let me try and offer a, a devil's advocate, slightly more positive counterpoint to that. In terms of te technology and the adoption of technology, especially in the way people work, the ability or the, the necessity of being geographically located uh, to your your colleagues effectively and, and people you work with is becoming less hmm. and there are there's a gradual increase now with the sort of spread of fast broadband into the countryside gradually yeah. um of businesses popping up in smaller towns and in yeah. other cities and then in, in the countryside as well and yeah. sort of rural tech effectively or tech-based businesses and therefore people living near those businesses is do you think there's a possibility that through use of things like 
connecting technologies and new forms of transport, like um, whether it's self-driving cars or even just better train links or whatever mm. it is, that we could actually shift people out of the city or out of the need to be in a large city and start to live a rural but high-tech life to a higher degree than maybe has happened in the last 30 or 40 years. That's my sort of optimistic <laughs> attempt. Yeah, well, I mean, my answer to that would be, um, oh, multiple. I mean, one is, in a sense, although I've just posited the model of the city, the arable land and the stuff beyond, in that arable land, you would have middle-class commuters, because you have now. Yeah. The, the, the idea, <laughs> yeah, the idea that the countryside is kind of, uh, is is all a bit kind of, you know, losing population. I mean, that's not true, is it? I mean, certainly in southern England, around here, the population of East Anglia in almost every single village, apart from the hinterlands of Norwich and Kings Lynn and the coast, almost every parish otherwise in East Anglia lost population between nine, uh, 1850 and 1950. Mm. Since then, that has been massively reversed. I mean, massively reversed. Really? We, we, I mean, incredibly, the amount of development and building around here is extraordinary. But uh, but an actual, sh- rather than a general increase, is it a, a greater shift from city areas to the... Well, more, it's part of the general there. massive population increase and they do, a lot of people okay. are coming to East Anglia. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's because of the house prices. They're forced out by the house prices. So so people are now commuting to Cambridge, you know, because Cambridge, no one can afford to live in Cambridge because that's all now the same price as London. I mean, it's, yeah. but those are different issues. But, yeah, sure, you could do all that. That's fine. I'm not saying that's not possible, but that doesn't actually change the basic production issues. Yeah, I see, yeah, I see what you mean. Because it's still that that idea of of nature as the retreat, effectively, isn't it? Like the, all the, the actual productive arable farmland is off in the less aesthetic places away from the cities, whereas the, the beautiful park, um, sort of aesthetic landscapes, natural wilded landscapes are around the people who can afford to move just outside the cities. So, so Yeah, but in it, terms of rewilding, where would you be able to rewild large scale? Well, in the UK, it would yeah. be the, the Scottish oh. Highlands and the sort of middle of Wales yeah. and the upland so, areas of England. So it would be and, like the upland areas of Europe spontaneously rewilding. That's the only yeah. point I'm really making. That it's a similar kind of... There's an economic... And a lot of this is driven by, will be driven by economics, ultimately, that, you, as you said earlier, you can only afford you know, cheap farm because of large scale subsidies. And we're basically doing that mm-hmm. because people value those landscapes. It's good for tourism. It's good for recreation. And, and they're culturally important. Now, once you start undermining that and saying, well, actually, no, they should be rewilded. I can kind of, as I said before, I can kind of see the sense in that. You know, I'm not, I'm not against rewilding. Absolutely not against rewilding. And, and there are certain areas which would be great if they're rewilded large areas of a really rather unproductive conifer plantation would be good for rewilding. The big blocks like Breckland, a lot of Breckland would be great if it was rewilded. I can see a sense in that. Although even there, you know, I'd like to see some of the open heaths kept because I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I think it I think it's a balance. That's really all I'm saying. And I think in the present drive for it, there aren't enough questions being asked. Quite precisely how it's gonna work. You know, the the ultimate basic background is we've got millions and millions and millions of people to feed. We can't feed the population that is in this country without dragging in food from other places, which is not good for all mm. kinds of reasons. So we're talking about putting in more land unproductive. Well, that's fine. I can see the sense in that as long as other values are taken into consideration first. So we want to avoid major design landscapes. We want to just avoid too much destruction of iconic cultural farming landscapes you know there are ways of doing it we want to make sure that we don't destroy habitats mm. which potentially you can do with the rewilding um that's something i should know more about but if you've got um if you've got open reed bed for example that's a good one reed beds are good um you've got a number of birds which you will know better than me that specialize in reed bed habitats and then you decide you're going to rewild the reed bed. So you're not going to do anything with it anymore. Well, uh, first of all, the alders come in. Uh, and then bits of birch will come in. Uh, the, before you know where you are, you're in a situation while in the Norfolk Broads. Do you know the Norfolk Broads? You've been on the a little Broads? bit, yeah. Uh, I don't suppose, if you get a boat at a place called um, Roxham, 
which is a big boatyardy holiday mm. place. You can go all the way down the River Bure as far as a place called Ampmouth, where Bennett's Abbey is. Right. Yeah. Almost all the way, you've got these amazing older swamps, older car, um, all the way, wall to wall. And I am sure that most of the people who are queuing up behind other boats, having a holiday, having spent the whole year stuck behind cars on the M25, <laughs> right? I'm sure they think that's a wild, natural, timeless landscape. Mm. But if you look at photographs of that landscape, even in the 1920s, it's completely open because it's managed reed bed. Yeah. Now, that's fine. That, in a sense, is rewilding. It's rewilded itself because the economics of reed beds collapsed. Uh, and of cutting uh, marsh hay for litter and the rest. That all went, so the, so back come the alders. But I'd like to see an audit on that. I'd like to see a proper biological audit, mm. a biodiversity audit. What is it better to have, the reed bed or wall-to-wall -wall alder or some kind of mix? Now, if it's some kind of mix or if it's all reed bed, that is not rewilding. That has to be intensively managed. Mm. And what I would like to know from the rewilding people is, have they done all these audits? Because I've not really seen that sort of stuff. I want to know if you take all the reed beds in England and you let them all rewild, would that increase biodiversity? Yeah. And my guess is no. Well, I suppose it's such a difficult thing to study, isn't it? Because partly the, new, the concept is pretty new and you'd need to do multiple decade studies, really, to properly analyse the effects no, you uh, wouldn't. No, 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 no. Wouldn't you? no, you wouldn't. In the case of those, you would do a biodiversity audit on on alder car, alder wood, and a biodiversity audit on reed bed, mm. and you would then do the calculation. If you increased one at the expense of the other, would that increase biodiversity? Now, if it does, fine. But I'm not entirely convinced. And if I, and if it is true, I, someone ought to write to all those nature wildlife trusts that are keeping reed beds open. Yeah. Well, again, it's, it's the sort of the romantic idea or the attachment to a particular kind of landscape versus biodiversity or rewilding as a separate concept, really, isn't it? No, it's not. No, with respect, it's not. It's two separate things, isn't it? One is saying it's not just biodiversity that should determine how we plan for the landscape. There's a lot of other considerations too. Mm. But the other is even in terms of biodiversity, we ought to, know, to start defining our terms. What do we mean by diversity? Are we measuring biodiversity? And if we allow everything to rewild, are we absolutely sure that in all circumstances we're actually increasing biodiversity? Mm. Because I'm not. Because what it is essentially saying, seems to me, is that over large areas of, of England, hopefully, in their terms, you would have wood pasture. You would have lightly grazed wood pasture. That's basically what they're after. So downland, north mm. downs, south downs. They would prefer it, I assume, to be wood pasture. Well, that might might be beneficial. It might be, but it, it it you would have to trade that off against people's enjoyment of downland, the wide views, the air, the turf, the springy turf, uh, the archaeology. I mean, deep tree growth on a lot yeah, of the yeah. monuments. You know, what would that say? There's a lot of lot. You know, there's an awful lot of things to be taken into consideration. That would be an example. But if I went to the reed bed one. The reed bed one, no, it wouldn't involve long, long durée studies, long term studies. It would involve simply comparing the habitat that you know, left to its own devices, will replace the one only sustained by management. What is the difference? What are you getting from one and the other? Mm. That would be it, I think. Yeah. So do you think that, um, that, that those sorts of studies aren't going on by DEFRA and by. The relevant bodies by the Forestry Commission and National England. Well, it may England be, but I've not heard of much, to be absolutely honest. Maybe wrong. Bring the mic oh, a little closer. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, um, 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 maybe wrong. I hope they are. I don't hear much of that when I go to conferences. Not that I go to an awful lot of conferences on biodiversity, but I may be different. I may be pleasantly surprised next week when I go to Sheffield um, and hear somebody saying, well, we're actually doing long-term studies. I have heard some. George Peterkin gave a paper... Um, in which he was contrasting the impact on of of management on woods with leaving them to their own devices, mm. for example. I mean, that was not from memory. If, if you listen to this, I probably got it wrong. But it was it certainly wasn't clear cut. Yeah, you know, you don't suddenly get a massive benefit from that. So. I hope it don't sound too negative. <laughs> well, no, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you so much is that you have a sort of critical view of this sort of new concept and whether it's a fad or not um i don't think that i don't think it's probably 
unfair to call it a fad, but it's certainly a, a trend, let's say, recently. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right that it's it's very easy to get tangled up in the sort of the emotions of it and the mm. and not take a more holistic view about what it is that actually what the implications are of certain of certain policies around re- rewilding for the landscape more widely um and, and sort of actually analyzing it on a objective and scientific level rather than a romantic level yeah i mean i said it 20 times to say it again i'm not against rewilding and i'm even not against rewilding in some contexts where it does serious violations to cultural landscapes there's a place that did a lot of work a few years back called nettishall heath it's in north suffolk and it's a nature it's a suffolk wildlife trust mm. And it was an area of open heath uh, and it then um, got neglected and it got an awful lot of birch and stuff on it. A lot of the open heath and disappeared. So then they're left with a management problem, what they're going to do with it. Mm. It's not helped by the fact that um, it went through a previous existence as a country park before the Wildlife Trust uh, acquired it, which means that everyone thinks they've got the right to run dogs on it. Um, which, I mean, if anyone's looking for a major threat to biodiversity, unlimited dog walking would be <laughs> one, but perhaps yeah. we're not cut there. Um, okay, now, we did all the lots of archaeological work on, 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 on the heath, and we were able to show that it had been cleared in the Bronze Age. It's been cleared for a very long time, you know, trees. You can tell that because the positions of the barrows, uh, the burial mounds are such that they're positioned on false crests to be visible from the valley below. There's clearly nothing in between, no trees, all that. Interestingly, <clears throat> it's not been undisturbed heath all that time because under where they've stripped areas to increase uh, soil disturbance for uh, track plants, most of the heath appears to have been ploughed at some point in the past. It's been ploughed up, it's been divided up, it's been used for wartime trainings, all kinds of things gone on. You know, it's a really active human landscape. Large areas have been quarried away um, in the medieval period and later for sand and gravel and indeed for chalk. So it's, it's kind of active, it's busy, busy, busy landscape, loads of stuff going on. And stuff. Then it's a, it's all that stops, then the trees come in. So what are they going to do? Well, you might say that I would think they need to strip the whole thing back to Heathland, um, but they're not doing that. And I think that's good what they're doing. What they're doing is they are thinning the trees, removing some trees. So some of it looks like wood pass, yeah. Some of it is heavily thinned and looks like open heathland again. But it's not a landscape that ever existed, as far as you can tell, in the past. It is an absolute construct. But fine, absolutely fine, because it's surrounded by pretty intensive arable fields and you need that degree of diversity to maintain as much wildlife as you possibly can in the concept. Of course, that's fine. I mean, no one's worrying about that. But whether you want to do that on all the Breckland heaths is a completely different question. Mm. Because the Breckland heaths, I don't know if you've ever been on any of the Breckland that's up, yeah, a little bit, yeah. You have been on the battle training area? Uh, the no, I've been near it, I think. Not. God, thank you. amazing. They turfed out five villagers in the war for tank training. Oh, yeah. And they told them they'd all come back at the end and they're still living on some council site in Thetford. Right? But the landscape is extraordinary because the army look after it brilliantly. They've got conservation mm. and all that. Nothing's been sprayed yeah, because it's gone straight from 1940s agriculture, 1930s yeah, yeah. agriculture. To, to in modern use uh, it's all sheep grazed it's just mile upon mile of, of, of empty heathland and what you can just about see was once farmland was reverted yeah, yeah. to heath it's absolutely beautiful and that you wouldn't I, would, I wouldn't want to stop that okay well in terms Context, of it's where you put it yeah yeah well in terms of moving forward then in how you think sort of the management on a sort of policy level needs to be changed like if you were in charge of defra for a I don't know, five years or something. Oh yeah. What What would be your policies that you would implement to sort of progress the, whether it's biodiversity or, or any other agenda? I would, oh. <laughs> without I, without I, ripping I, up the entire rule book too much. No, no. I would. I would first thing I do. I would get in advice from a from a good ecologist. And I think if I was getting advice from a good good ecologist, it would be Paul Dolman who works here, who's a fantastic ecologist with a good interest in history and, and a slightly sceptical view, I think, about rewilding. But I'll get Paul in. But what I would think I would do overall would be I would sit down and work out where rewilding is likely to cause maximum benefits. Maximum benefits. And those benefits would probably be calculated not merely in terms of, of biodiversity, although largely in terms of biodiversity, not entirely. I'd also think about 
access who could get there. Um, I would think about um, economic benefits that rewilding could potentially bring to particular areas. So I would consider, for example, large scale rewilding of uh, derelict land. You know, that would mm. be that would be a useful thing to do. Uh, rather than these endless swathes of green you see on former kind of coal mine sites, you know, let the thing go go wild. That would be great. Yeah, and those would be depressed areas, and those are often depressed areas anyway. And that would be, you know, bulk bulk them up a bit to do them some good. I would, so I would I would be selecting areas to rewilding, and I'll be thinking about. I know it's a slightly outmoded concept, but the kind of corridor concept. I want stuff to yeah. be linked. Yeah, uh, and that linkage might be through kind of rewilded corridors, a limited extent. Um, chosen again on in terms of the sort of criteria we've, all, we've talked about in terms of maximum benefit, but minimum disbenefit. So you wouldn't want them where they're clearly doing a damage to Capability Brown Park, a really nice bit traditional countryside, etc. The the third aspect would be I would simply make the assumption that um, that tradition. I hate the word traditional. There is no other word, <laughs> but kind of you know. Uh, well-managed, intricate farmland, even if it's combined with intensive farming, you see the distinction, but with a good mesh of corridors of hedges, mm. small woods, hedgerow trees, I would put money into that and also field margins so that you were running agriculture within a framework. It doesn't have to be a terribly tight framework, but tighter than it is in many parts of East Anglia, certainly, or where of stuff which would in, which would be good for pollinators apart from anything else, where and would act as corridors between the rewilded corridors and rewilded areas. Yeah, and I would do all this on the basis of of formulating, I'm afraid, old fashioned, a plan. Yeah, uh, I, I think you need a landscape scale plan for a landscape scale problem, and the problem is the declining declines of biodiversity. So you would sit down and you would have uh, you would get people. There would be arguments, there would be discussions, and then you would fund it by, um, uh, in a similar way to the present schemes are actually run. But you would just think about a little bit harder about targeting it. Yeah. You might decide certain areas you weren't going to bother with at all. You might well say, well, the fe I know they're restoring the fen in the great fen in parts of Cambridgeshire, but a lot of the fens they have really no time depth much historically they never loomed large in the british psyche of being attractive landscapes some of that you might just think well just keep it as it is just keep plowing it i mean mm. you might so i think but i th i i would make those kind of decisions would that make that make sense yeah no it definitely makes sense I mean, in terms of um hedgerow planting and creating more margins do you think that was better done as a directly funded sort of government scheme or should it be a, a regulation on i don't know on field sizes and maximum field sizes and that kind of thing because obviously I, you say to farmers like we want you to plant loads more hedges they're going to say well give us the money we can't afford it yeah so I how agree. do you solve that problem well i i, I think there should be a a, 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 a maximum field size i, I really yeah. do presumably I regionally think... calibrated to be different in different areas because obviously you, that changes you, you you could i mean i i the the, the 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 terrible thing the terrible thing about what happened to the english countryside in the 60s and early 70s you know when everything was kind of grubbed up ponds are filled in and all that uh that if you talk to the people now who did it they don't actually sit down and, and say, oh, it was, you know, I sat down and calculated how much it was costing to, ma to maintain that hedge. It was just easy to grab it up. Or I realised that I was having so many turns on the combine that I was, it was losing petrol and all that. No, it, it was, it was an, just another fad. Yeah. Well, uh, guess... In a sense, you know, fad's the thing. So, <laughs> you know, it's not, I'm not saying it's the same, yeah, yeah. but people have a view of the landscape of what the landscape should be like, which is conditioned by whatever the kind of zeitgeist is. Mm. At the moment, the zeitgeist is, oh, biodiversity, we're losing, we've got to lose something. What can we do? Well, wow, I'm sick of living in this town full of all these people. I want to go escape, hear the wolf howling in the wilderness, and somehow that you know that's makes mm. me nearer to nature, even though I won't touch a sausage anymore. But <laughs> if you talk to these people, they will say it was modern. We grubbed out the hedges because we wanted a modern landscape. We were creating a landscape in a modern image, a post-war optimistic. You know, we got over to war, we beat the Germans, there's food shortages, we can tackle that too. We've got this modern technology. It's exactly the same mentality as as, as flattened, you know, market towns and, and, and built high-rise flats. I mean, it's exactly the same kind of mentality. These they are all kind of connected, although we like to see them as separate. Mm. 
So in terms of the business of how you would decide about hedgerows, I don't, I mean, I would immediately say, for example, every public road should have a hedgerow next to it. Yeah. What was wrong with that? Yeah. If well, you I haven't think... got a hedge next to it, well, you know, you, you, you have, that's that, you, you've got to do that. Right, well, and so and right. thing perhaps things setting like um, margin uh, conditions, so minimum of five meters or yeah. whatever the rule is. Absolutely, yeah. well, because I don't think we can muck about anymore. I think that that and that's the other issue about sorry about about rewilding is it attract it it it, it does address an awful lot of issues about biodiversity, but it doesn't address them all. It doesn't address, as I was saying before, the particular requirements for rare species necessarily. That's a problem. Mm. But it doesn't necessarily address the kind of bioservices, green services thing, in that if you need pollinators for the arable fields, mm. rewilding Lan you know, upland Lancashire doesn't necessarily do the trick, does it? Mm. So there are good reasons why, for purely selfish food production reasons, why um, field margins are going to be necessary. And they are going to be necessary, and we're going to have to do it. I mean, that's, and however we do it, in a sense, is less important than the absolute driven necessity that we will have to do it. Yeah. Well, again, I think, is there a technological um, potential solution to this? Because you see all these new robotic tractors coming along. Mm. And all, all the sort of intelligent guided systems for mm. farming mm. Pro will probably make it easier to deal with more intricate field networks, I guess, from an agricultural point of view. I mean, I'm not a farmer, so I don't know. But no, I think that's right. I'm thought about that, but I, I, I would think that's right. That's See, I'm not completely. I mean, I don't get. I'm not completely pessimistic about a lot of this. I mean, I think there are ways in which we can do stuff, and I sometimes wonder whether the problems are as much political as anything else and and the kind of of kind of capitalist profit driven goods driven society we've created is the problem and that that some of the other issues would sort of be more tractable if we did were did better in those particular social and economic mm. configurations I think. Well, the ultimate solution is to combine the two, isn't it? To, yes. to make rewilding or, or increasing biodiversity financially incentivized, effectively. Yes. To, but it's how to do that. It's a really difficult I, thing it, to do. It is a difficult one. It is a difficult one. But I think in the process, we have to define the goals carefully. And I think if we define the goal as rewilding, we're not defining the true goal. That's yeah. my feeling. We, And I do think... So I'm going to bang on about political stuff, but there is something <laughs> about that kind of rewilder reserve you can go out to if you can afford to pay for the travel. And mm. when you're there, if you can afford to go on the safari, yeah. and it's away well, from your normal life. Yeah, well, that's why I mentioned the sort of the this idea of, of urbanisation, of more and more people from cities um, seeing the countryside and as something other as something they visit and something that's mm. sort of strange and different and somewhere you go spend your weekends because you like a nice view and a nice walk yeah. rather than actually part of day-to-day -day life yeah, in a more integrated a way and i don't necessarily know if that's a solvable problem if you if you can't well, reverse it in other ways. I, well you no, well you can and you can't i mean i think there's an awful lot of potential for greening the cities yeah, no, absolutely. You know, in, absolutely. A sense, in a sense, that that's a modern fad. I've got more sympathy with it in some ways, because in terms of of people, it, you know, it may not massively increase biodiversity. Although I think that's probably you know up for grabs. But but in terms of people's experience mm. and how they relate to nature and how that therefore changes their attitudes to the bigger issues of nature conservation. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I'm very much in favour of that. It's one of the areas I'm particularly interested in is how is integrating more of nature into urban environments, mm. with, partly for ecological reasons, but also for psychological reasons to tie people back to that idea of nature to even the tiniest degree extra than they are now is incredibly valuable. And I think that would go some way to helping people understand policy in, in the countryside better and to sort of see yeah, it, I think that's right. to sort of have more sympathy with it, effectively. Do you ever go to places like Thetford or Stevenage? Uh, <coughs> I've been to both Thetford and Stevenage. Because in that times. phase of town planning, there was that um, phase where they put big areas of green mown lawn between the houses. Yeah, well, it's in the arts and crafts and um, 
urban planning movement. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of po- the late end of that because Stevenage is kind of post car really. But I just look at those and I think, well, bloody hell, that's a waste. You know, that's something you could do with something like that. You know, even if you just had it as a hay cut, mm. you'd be doing major benefits. Well, I've noticed in something that's quite encouraging in London, a lot of and other cities, a lot of councils are effectively fencing off what was pristine lawn mm. and letting it grow and oh, right, be rewild, okay. which is very encouraging. Yeah. Part because they probably do it for maintenance reasons because they then don't have to send a guy out with a lawnmower every oh, week. Economics again, yeah. Um, but also it's very good aesthetically and, and in terms of biodiversity because you mm. get all this plant species coming up and yeah. more insect life and this kind of thing. And I think there's a sort of, there's a messiness to nature that people are often uncomfortable with. Yes. And I think there needs to be a gradual realisation and, and, and sort of greater, gradual um, getting used to that effectively to the messiness of nature coming into cities and being part of urban environments rather than this sort of pristine idea of manicured lawns and perfect edge borders I, I completely agree I completely agree um, and I would take that further in the sense that there are some urban or urban fringe landscapes which people want to tidy up by making them like nature, if you sort of mean, by planting trees, make them into woods and stuff, mm. which actually have probably have higher biodiversity value as being bits of derelict land. You know, yeah. Particular kinds of things on, on you know, uh, mineral waste, for example, you know, tracks certain things. So in a sense, I do sometimes wonder whether half, not half, a bit of the problem about our attitude to nature is we think of nature as either rewilded kind of really wild stuff or we think of it as rural stuff. But there are other forms of, of, of nature have developed in urban and derelict you know, land. Again, I'm out of my depth here, but I mean, there's a lot of work being done on it and they've got high biodiversity. Yeah. Right? Well, I always think of, sort of Victorian um, terraces and street patterns where you've got a plot of land is not a sort of long, thin strip and a third of it is the house and two thirds of it is the garden, mm. effectively. Mm. And that creates a huge amount of biodiversity in the garden systems, yeah. effectively. Um, but then there's one of the things that worries me is we're now moving away from that where we have much smaller plots, mm. much smaller gardens, and yeah. people just have a little courtyard that's the same plot area as the house at most. Yes. Rather than sort of a, this idea of having a proper size garden at the back of your house that actually has some sort of natural value. And yeah, but value it's difficult, isn't it? Because the alternative, I mean, I agree with you, but the difficult, the, the reason for that, of course, is to reduce the amount of urban sprawl. Mm. And there is, and I do sometimes think that the really difficult questions are not being asked, and not just in terms of decline of biodiversity, but the way, the way there's a narrative about certain ecological issues and not others. So, global warming is something we talk about, and it's a way of talking about issues, but nobody really talks about the threats of of rampant population growth. Mm. But actually, global warming is largely dependent on, largely a result of rampant population growth. You wouldn't have global warming if the population was a tenth of what it is. Mm. And I do worry that an awful lot of, for some reason, we can't talk about that anymore. Mm. Uh, for a whole lot of political reasons, some good, so, some not so good. And I don't understand why you can have a doctor on the television saying we've made this great breakthrough, we can keep think we can keep keep people alive for twenty years longer than we used to be able to. And I'm thinking, well, why isn't somebody saying to her, Do you realise what that's going to do? You know, what what are you playing at? Do you have no responsibility whatsoever to the planet? And I, 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 I worry a little that when we have these conversations about sustaining biodiversity, you know, global warming, we are actually hedging round a number of other issues which we're not prepared to address. Population growth being one, standards of living cons- and the amount of consumer crap we all buy being another. You know, these are poli- difficult political issues mm. and talking about the other stuff is, I wonder if it's epiphenomenal exactly, but it's it, it's not quite addressing it. Yeah, well, I think it's, I found it interesting with the, all these Extinction Rebellion activists out recently in, in London causing trouble. Um they're sort of focused on one issue, which is climate change mm. and of sort of CO two emissions, yeah. as it's this sort of one thing. But you never see anyone out sort of fighting for biodiversity generally, or no. for the sort of species. I lot. suppose it's because it's a way of framing a conversation. I suppose if I was being charitable, but I yeah. kind of agree. But then I, I think it's this sort of this lumping of 
environmental issues into climate change as one blob effectively yeah. rather than a whole series of different issues across many different areas yeah. that all have different effects and have different trade-offs yeah and there's sort of again it's this sort of romanticization of there's this one big issue which we need to fight mm. and and rather than addressing sort of the actual practical level of what's happening at different places mm -hmm. and different circumstances but then it is complicated <laughs> really oh yeah well yeah exactly and that's that well i think that's part of the barrier to it is that people do it is such a complex issue with so many sort of political and philosophical and, and sort of emotional mm. things tied into different aspects yeah. of it that people like to just separate it off as oh climate change that's the the one good thing that's we can or fight biodiversity for. that's the panacea yeah or well, well yeah biodiversity as a single thing yeah that would be i suppose we better bring this to an end in a minute yeah, yeah really work. i think that would probably you've summed up what my main reservation is it's seen as a panacea i don't think it's a panacea i think in in practical terms he's never going to get that far off the ground except in certain restricted areas and i think we take our eye off the ball of all the other ways we maintain biodiversity and get other benefits from the landscape if we put all our eggs in that basket well on that note professor tom williamson thank you very much thank you very much